now we continue our discussion. In 2017, we focused our symposium on the changing nature of mobility. During this event, we had a panel look towards the future of electric, shared, and automated transportation. James Audubon was one of the members of the panel. If you go back to his presentation, you'll find that many of his comments were indeed an accurate look to the future then, the present now. The organization he founded, RethinkX, is one of the world's foremost organizations looking at the speed and scale of technology-driven disruption and its implications across society. I'd like to say that James is an expert, but he reminded us all in 2017 that the problem with experts is that in their minds, there are few possibilities, as opposed to the mind of a beginner who sees many. It is a pleasure to welcome again James Arba, an expert beginner looking at the future of food. James. John, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. It's, uh, it's great to be back here. So, so I was here 2017 talking about transportation. I'm going to speak about food today. Uh, RethinkX, my organization, was founded uh, just about 18 months before that event. And I just want to tell you the story of our founding, because I think it kind of frames the story I'm going to tell today. So I found myself in Washington, D.C. back in 2016. I was invited to a, to a U.S. military think tank who were having a scenario planning day. Uh, they, were explore, they, were, they were asking the question, what will it mean for global geopolitics if we get off fossil fuels very quickly? And they invited a bunch of experts along. Uh, I'm not allowed to name them. It was Chatham House Rules with military enforcement, apparently, which uh, still terrifies me. But we, um, I, I sat through this day of presentations, 10 presentations in all, including mine. And, and almost all the forecasts that we got for the adoption of solar PV, for the adoption of electric vehicles and so on, from these experts, these huge organizations, were these kind of straight line forecasts out into the future, like very low levels of adoption of, 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 of any of these clean technologies, even by 2050, in some of these forecasts. And I remember this guy called Tony Sieber getting up when it was his turn to talk. And he said, look, that's not how disruption works. It's not this slow, incremental progression. It's rapid. It's non-linear. And these things are over by the 2030s, he said. And if you're going to make your plans based on these faulty forecasts, you're going to make some major mistakes. So here are, here are some of those forecasts. So this is the IEA prediction for solar PV, how much solar PV will have in the world. You can see every year they issue a forecast, and every year they're wrong. It's always a straight line. The actual line is exponential. You can see that's doubling every three years. We're at 3% in the U.S. already, right? That's five doublings until we get to 100%. We're on track to transform the energy system. This is the EIA forecast for, uh, sorry, it's a mess of graph, but this is a forecast for, the, for electric vehicle adoption. 118 EVs, they thought, would be in the U.S. by 2035. I mean, ludicrous. My partner, Tony, wrote a book called Clean Disruption in 2014, where he forecasts that 100% of new vehicle sales would be electric by 2030. My people laughed at him. But it's on track now. We're above 10% already this year, and it's accelerating. But we have almost no doubt that we won't be selling gasoline vehicles by 2030. And I just added this one in. These are meat forecasts out to the year 2050 from the FAO. We'll come back and, and see why I think these might be wrong later on. So it's really important to understand disruptions because they, they, they affect your decisions about the future. And they have all kinds of cascading impacts. They don't just affect the sector involved. They affect every aspect of society. And they happen quickly. And they can transform society quickly. So I just included this slide, because the first car in America was sold in 1896. Twenty years later, we have the dean of NYU recommending people eat horse meat, because we have a, a whole host, we have a whole host of horses that we don't need for transportation anymore. Like Twenty years. And of course, it had massive impacts on you know, our cities, on geopolitics, on all kinds of other things. So really what my talk's about 
It's about how change happens, how we can better understand the complex processes of change, and also perhaps why we get things wrong. So this is how change happens in any complex system, like whether it's a human body, or it's a, a climate system, or it's a sector of the economy. We get long periods of incremental change or stasis where the system's held in equilibrium by a series of constraining forces, negative feedback loops. And at a certain point, we can pass a tipping point, and the system flips really rapidly into a new system state as accelerating forces take over and drive it very rapidly into a new state. So if we think about the climate system, and I'm sure you guys all understand this much better than me, but this is my, my climate 101. At the moment, we're in a stable equilibrium, right? it's called the Holocene. And we have those forces on our side, so we're emitting huge quantities of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Right? But atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations have gone up by less than we'd expect, because over half of those emissions are sucked out by the oceans and, the, and, 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 and plant growth. Right? So it's constraining, um, it's constraining change right now. Temperatures have risen by less than we had expected, if all else is equal, in the absence of those forces. What's truly worrying about climate change is if we pass a certain threshold, a certain tipping point, those negative feedback loops begin to unwind. We might see oceans go from being a carbon sink to a carbon source, and we trigger a host of other accelerating feedback loops. Like we melt the Arctic ice and we trap more of the Earth and the sun's energy in the Earth's atmosphere. You know, we see the Arctic tundra melting and so on. We get this reinforcing change where we flip very quickly from one system state into another several degrees higher and everything changes, right? It's a transformed system. And that's what happens in the economy. Right? So this understanding change matters. But what we tend to do when we look to the future is that we kind of extrapolate today into the future. And that's fine when you're in that equilibrium state. And you can do that. It's not a bad approximation for the future. When you come up to this point and change is about to happen, we're about to pass those tipping points. It's a terrible strategy and it leaves you profoundly wrong. And yet we do this time and time again, whether we're businesses or investors or governments. And it matters for jobs and communities that get disrupted, and for education, for geopolitics, for our approach to solving climate change, for all kinds of things. And most of the time, we're just extrapolating today into tomorrow. So Tony and I created this framework, and I'm, I'm going to apply it to the food system in a second, and we'll get, we'll get going on that. But it, it, it seeks to understand these complex processes of change and to apply them to the economy, and to apply them to society as a whole, actually. So this is what we see when we apply our framework to food. We published this report uh, about two years ago now. So what we see coming is a really a second domestication but the first domestication was that of the macroorganism, the plant and the animal. What we're seeing on the horizon is a domestication of the microorganism. And that's going to transform everything. So disruptions often start with a convergence. But you need a number of different technologies to, to break through and create new possibilities. So to produce a, a, a viable car requires breakthroughs in steel production, best in one process. Uh, in, in terms of tires in the bicycle industry, in terms of the vulcanization of um, rubber, and of course the combustion engine, all of those came together and allowed us to create a car. But it's not just new products and services, but we get new possibilities uh, in, in all kinds of dimensions, a new business model, the whole value chain changes, the infrastructure. We create new market opportunities, we don't just replace the old. And it transforms uh, the drivers of any particular sector. So in food, we see a convergence of a number of technologies that are allowing us to produce proteins, lipids, and so on, complex organic molecules, in a number of different ways. The key technologies that I'm going to deal with today, cellular agriculture and precision fermentation. Precision fermentation is essentially where we hack microbes and get them to produce uh, the complex organic molecules that we want them to produce. So convergence creates new possibilities. So today, most of our food comes from 12 plants and five animals. We're kind of constrained by what we can domesticate, what's economic for us 
to grow. With these new technologies, those constraints disappear. We can produce almost anything we want and design the kind of properties we want. Those sorts of things that are incredibly scarce today can be abundant tomorrow through these technologies. And we can produce things that are too expensive to extract from nature. Right? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Or we can produce things like human breast proteins right, to feed our children, which you can't do today. So uh, there are ethical issues uh, with, with producing human breast milk through traditional farming uh, approaches. Um, so you see, so once we get these new products and services emerge into the market, we see them continue to improve in cost. And it's these cost drivers that drive the disruption. We saw the car dramatically improve. Like my, my partner Tony says cost curves are like gravity. And so these are some of the underlying cost curves that we see underpinning this transformation we're going to see in the food space. And super aggressive um, cost curves, like Moore's Law, improvements in computer processing, right? If you'd been in 1970, say, and computer processing had got a thousand times cheaper over the last 15, over the previous 15 years, you know, even the greatest experts would know, have no idea how that process is going to continue, how we're going to continue at the same rate. But you might have been able to see a generation or two of chips, you know, three or five years ahead. But you would have no idea, you know, technically, how we can continue to improve. But we see that computer processing costs come down a billion times since 1970. And the same is true in a number of technologies. These cost curves really are like gravity. Once they're on the way, all kinds of processes, all kinds of ingenuity come in. And we see them continue far further than we can possibly imagine. Um, so what we're seeing in the food space, and this is a, a graph of Brazilian fermentation, as costs come down, we open up new markets. And so it started um, precision fermentation in, 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 in the pharmaceutical market. The first molecule we produced was human insulin. Right? And as the costs come down, we're opening other, other markets. Cosmetics have been opened up. We're seeing some materials replaced by these technologies. And we're beginning to become competitive in food markets, and we become uh, competitive with bulk proteins at about $10 a kilo. We're, 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 we're getting towards that point. We think by the decade, we'll be able to produce certain proteins at that kind of cost. So it used to take 50,000 animals, the, the pancreas of 50,000 animals, to produce a kilogram of, um, of, 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 of insulin. And of course, it was the worst product. It was poorly tolerated in comparison to human insulin. Uh, and it was hugely expensive. We see the, the first kilo produced through precision fermentation in the 1980s was about a billion dollars a, uh, for, for, for that kilogram. We see the cost decline dramatically over time. And we see very rapid disruptions of the market now, so we, always, we use almost no animal, animal insulin anymore. But it's not just costs that improve, it's also capabilities. And these technologies and these products improve in all kinds of different dimensions. In terms of food, we're seeing improvements in terms of taste, in terms of structure, in terms of the versatility of these products, in terms of the convenience. Right? This is a distributed system uh, where production can happen much closer to supply. And of course, they're vastly more efficient, far less feedstock, far less energy, far less water, and a, and a huge drop in the amount of land we need to produce these proteins. The really important thing to understand about disruption is that it represents what we call a phase transformation. But the new market or the new food system that emerges will look nothing like the current system. As Buckminster Fuller says, there's nothing about a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. And John talked about something I said last time. I said it's absolutely true. The more expertise you have in the current system, the more you have to unlearn. So we saw in the, in the, in the transportation market, not only, did it, not only did cars replace horses, but they created a vast new market opportunity. For some of these really size, a vast new market opportunity, far bigger than the one that existed before. And it also created an oil industry, a totally new value chain, and so on and so forth. A totally different transportation system emerged with a totally different set of possibilities. 
So what is a phase translation in food? But ultimately, the, the system of production is moving from what we call a breakdown model of production, where we grow the whole plant and animal, and we break it down into the things we need. Um, so in this current system that we have, the cheapest and the easiest to get to in terms of processing cost is, say, the steak or the meat, which we just slice off the carcass. The most expensive to get to are the single molecules, like the collagen, the insulin, the whey brew, the, the, the whey, and so on, that we have to go through a number of processing cycles to get to. The new model is the opposite. We start with a single cell or a single molecule, and we build up to more complex products. So it's a totally different economic model, where the cheapest things to get to are the single molecules, and the most expensive and difficult are things like the steak. And that defines how this disruption we think is going to unfold. But we don't just think of disrupt existing markets. We have the potential to create entirely new markets as well through these technologies. So the other way in which the, the, the phase transformation or, or, or a transformation of this system what we call food as software. And so we can now design foods and molecules um, in a kind of iterative process, right? Every month we can release new versions. It's almost like software releases in many ways. We're continually getting better and continually improving in, in all kinds of different parameters. And that's something that cow just can't compete with. It can't evolve at the kind of pace that you can improve these products. We move to, we think, to a very different system, an industrialized um, livestock system that now is kind of very centralized. We see this production moving to a much more distributed kind of network and node approach. We have much more localized production. The inputs into the system available locally. So disruption is occurring. We think it's beginning already, but it's beginning to occur across multiple dimensions. The first thing to be disrupted, as I was saying, are the things that are either more scarce, or it's the single molecules, or where we have uh, an where we have a molecule that's an ingredient into another product, and they're the easiest and the cheapest to disrupt. The latest disruption we say the steak, the most structurally complex and difficult for for us to to to, to, um, to replace. One of those disruptions that's already on the way I want to look at is, is a, what we call an ingredients disruption, where we can take a single molecule and improve or create an entirely new product. So milk is one of the disruptions that we see happening early on. The dairy industry we think is under threat early on, but it's only 3.3% of a gallon of milk is protein. So that's the piece we have to disrupt. And we're already seeing a huge number of products come into that market, in ice creams, in yogurt, and so on, where milk is an ingredient into another product. So the full liter of milk, or the full pint of milk, will be the last part to be disrupted. But we don't think that's too far away at all. Same with cheese. We think that's another easy disruption, and we're already seeing it. In fact, we've been using precision fermented rennet or a rennet alternative for decades now. I think something like 80% of cheese that we consume already has one of these products. So as these products get adopted in all kinds of different models, we kick off a series of accelerating feedback loops that drive that S curve of disruption. And those accelerating loops are, are both virtuous cycles for the new and vicious cycles for the existing industry. And so what we're seeing are you know, lowering costs, causing increased demand, increasing economies of scale. We're seeing more investment flood into the sector. We're seeing more government support. We're seeing consumer preference begin to change as people begin to accept these products. And they're kind of a virtual cycle that leads to the adoption of the new. The existing industry goes in the reverse. But we'll see over time reducing demand reversing economies of scale, less government support, but because of all the other things that come with livestock farming that are likely to change the regulatory environment once we have a viable alternative. So the cow goes in, it gets broken up into all kinds of different things, and as those various products that it ends up in get 
disrupted piece by piece, the single molecules first and the ingredient second. We'll be left with just a steak. Right? And that's a really strong feedback loop. Right? Because we'll have to grow the whole animal just to produce the meat. So the cost of that steak will increase. And a number of the things that we sell from the cow that currently are assets, we sell for money, like the hide. We make leather from when that market gets disrupted. That might become a liability. We might have to pay to dispose of it. And so we're going to see an increase in costs for existing livestock products over time as the new products continue to continue to decrease and they're built to grow. And that's what drives this S-shaped curve of disruption. So, um, and we, see, we see that shape over and over again. The growth of the new and the collapse of the old. It's a shape of disruption. We don't expect anything different in this market. So by the 2030s, we see a complete transformation of this industry. And certainly by 2040, we see you know, really most of these markets uh, transformed. So if we're right, and livestock farming is largely disrupted by the 2040s, what does that mean? There's some huge changes coming. So obviously going to be changes in land use, which I'm going to come to later, in terms of water use, in terms of feed use, in terms of, of, of waste production and deforestation, the implications on fertilizer use, and tractors, and so on and so forth, antibiotic use, foodborne disease, all kinds of things affected by the disruption of livestock. It might be what we call the great land liberation of 40%. Got five minutes left. I am way behind them, okay? <laughs> I get carried away when I get up there. Um, 40% of, 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 of US land is, is, is devoted to cows, right? Either pasture land or grown their feed. A huge amount of land, it's similar globally. We need a fifth of that, and this has been generous. We need a fifth of the land. We should free up huge quantities of land that we go through. But we can either build, um, we can either allow our cities to expand into or we can use for energy, or we can rewild or reforest or use the carbon sink. But globally, we expect an area the size of China, the US, and Australia combined to be freed from land stock farming um, by the 2040s. Right? Fast, fast, fast quantities of land. And so land goes from being a carbon source to a carbon sink. It's all the pressure off deforestation, all the pressure off the soils. We can do all kinds of things with that land. Farming communities, hugely important. Right? Most disruptions, you destroy jobs in one area, create them in another, requiring different skills. Right? This, uh, we have a chance to protect. It's a key principle. We, we talk about disruption, we protect people, not industries. But we have a chance to protect those people involved in these industries, protect those communities, create better jobs. Essentially, as land stewards, rewilding, reforesting, looking after that land, stewarding that land. But it's not just, it's not just um, you know, food and agriculture that's being disrupted. We're seeing a massive change in our energy system, in our transportation system, in pretty much every sector of the economy. And the impact of these changes are going to cascade and, and, and transform all kinds of environmental challenges that we have today. We'll see vastly lower cost of food. We'll see food security improve dramatically as we move down this path. The impact of the energy disruption, for instance, and the automation of labor on things like vertical farming create the possibility of entirely new and cheaper ways of growing things. Vertical farming doesn't really work economically today because of costs of energy and the costs of labor. But as those get transformed as well over the course of the next decade, it becomes entirely possible to grow a lot more indoors. So what does it mean for what is it, sorry, the slides have all been corrupted as well. So what does it mean for global greenhouse gas emissions? So we modeled this, we published some paper on, on climate change recently that, that put all our analysis together, but it's transformative. Right, the three sectors of the economy, energy, transport, and food, responsible for 75% of global emissions. And we think we'll see a disruption to each of those systems by 2040. Right, largely decarbonizing each of those industries. But with the land freed up from, from, from livestock farming as well.
well, we have the opportunity for a huge carbon sink. Right, so, so we get left with about 10% of emissions by 2040 or the early 2040s. But uh, is, we call the last carbon problem. I don't know why that's dropped down there. We call it the last carbon price, things like aviation and, and, and all long haul aviation are very difficult to disrupt, but we don't have economic solutions. Um, but we might not have to worry about that because we'll have a super abundance of carbon free clean energy by 2040, right, which we can use to sequester carbon at grand scale. We'll have other tools by 2040. So, really, for us, the problem of giant climate changes over the next 20 years. Can we avoid triggering those tipping points? Can we avoid um, tipping our climate system into a new state? If we can, by 2040 or so, we'll have options to sequester carbon at a vast scale in ways we can't even imagine today. And that's really the challenge. So there's a huge amount of hope in trying to solve this problem. But if we just focus on the old system and we try and make that system less bad, and we don't see the potential of this entirely new system. In some ways, our minds are inside the box of that old system. Everything we're doing is trying to solve yesterday's problems. Uh, we call them band-aid solutions. Yes, they're important. We have to patch up that old system and make it last. But we can create a new system where the, the, the kind of tensions that exist in the current system between social outcomes, between environmental outcomes, between economic outcomes, don't exist. It's a different system. Uh, I've gone on far too long. I've had the cards held up to me, and I'm going to stop there. I had a few more slides to run through, but um, thank you very much for your time.